it was the final day of the FTX Crypto Cup. Magnus Carlsen and Wesley So battling it out. Previous day, they drew their set. And so this set was going to be decisive or they would go into an Armageddon. Well, there was so much happening. Um, I'm just going to show you one game from today's play. And I really like this game. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. And do consider supporting us via PayPal or Patreon links down there. So this is game one of the Rapids. Magnus Carlsen against Wesley So. And the previous day, if you've perhaps you've seen my videos already, you can see that it was very evenly contested. Magnus Carlsen said he wasn't feeling too good. He didn't press hard with the white pieces, which was very unusual for him. He said he was feeling ill. So had he recovered going into this second and final day? So Carson with the white pieces and this solid semi-tarash opening from Wesley So. Now Carlson doesn't go in for the exchanges that take place after pawn takes pawn and d5, where we saw uh, Nepo come a cropper against So in that line. Instead, Carlson plays e3. And this can often lead to isolated queen's pawn positions, but actually the way things go, Wesley goes straight in for uh, a transposition actually to the queen's gambit accepted. And Carlson likes to play like this. This looks very modest from white. The bishop being pushed back by these a6 and by a6 and b5. But there is a drawback to these black pawns on the queen side, as we're going to see. And Carlson very comfortable with this position. In fact, Carlson and So have done battle from exactly this position on two previous occasions. Now Carlson exchanges on d8. The king does find a home on e7, although it's not it looks fine at the moment, it's not always secure there. And the knight swings round. So previously, um, Wesley So has played bishop b6 against Carlson. In this game, he plays knight d7, protecting the bishop, which he's done before. And in that previous game, Carlson played knight a5 um, and, and took that bishop, but actually didn't get really any advantage. This time, Carlson played rook d1. And, okay, the rook comes to, to the open file, it looks very reasonable. And now the bishop drops back to b6, which covers the a5 square. And here is a very important idea, a4. So this attempts to break up these pawns. Obviously, that will split the pawns, um, allows white's knight in, and can start you know, hitting these knights, hit these squares, which looks very nice. And then as the position opens up, you can just imagine, you know, a check on this diagonal could be nasty for the king. So you don't really want to take here. B4 instead. And now absolutely key move here for white. You don't move the knight, but instead you throw in this Zwischenzug, an in-between move. Now... Wesley plays the bishop back to a7. Let's just have a look at pawn takes knight. Pawn takes bishop on b6. And now we can see that if pawn takes pawn, bishop takes. I mean, this is what black would like to do to exchange pawns. But actually, this is incredibly risky once the bishop gets to this diagonal to attack the king. White has a really terrifying initiative there. So after a5, instead of opening things, Wesley just drops the bishop back to a7. But now, because the pawn has advanced, this knight is able to come to a4 and finds a good square. So you can see these knights have very interesting possibilities coming to these squares. These pawns have been split. And they're both a little bit vulnerable. Now you can see actually that bishop on e2 
it's actually on a very nice diagonal looking at the pawn on a6 and that pawn on b4 is potentially vulnerable to this bishop here so all in all this is actually quite a pleasant position for white having said that there's still a very long way to go and well wesley has a little bit of activity hits the knight knight b4 knight d4 rather rook h b8 so it defends the pawn and potentially gives the king uh, room to step back bishop d2 pressure on the pawn so these bishops look pretty good knight c5 so wesley trying to relieve a bit of pressure and carlson exchanges and plays rook c1 well let's just compare the pieces so black's rooks are rather stuck in the corner white's rooks on the two open files that looks pretty good white's bishops trained on these weak pawns black's bishops well are they well particularly the bishop on c5 are they sitting targets in the middle of the board certainly you know they're not really attacking anything so the rook threatens the bishop of course if the rook steps across then rook takes bishop anyway and once again you can see that king would be caught in a, in a deadly pin there where's the exchanges off bishop for knight now that does mean that he's able to use that d5 square so that bishop has some security and the king steps across now to d7 to prevent the rook coming in at c7 so an intriguing position you know at first glance it would seem that black is actually fine here because of the control of this d5 square the blockade of the isolated pawn but actually pretty soon you realize that this is really a very pleasant position for white and it's a position where the rooks and bishops work incredibly well together so for example the move that one would like to play here is rook c8 but we can exchange now rook takes allows bishop takes pawn and king takes allows a check and then the rook will land on c7 so that's you can see the pieces the bishops and the rook combining beautifully so that's why the rook after this bishop attack just stepped up to b7 covering the c7 square but that's pretty passive both rooks passive now and i really like carlson's next move did he continue with some attack on the queen side no he just played pawn to h4 now that's carlson just kind of flexing he's just saying okay i'm gonna gain some space on the king side thank you very much and you know i can give my king a nice escape square in case later on there's a problem with the back rank really nice he's basically saying to wesley you can't really do much in this position and he's right because these pieces these rooks in particular are so passive the minor pieces look great but they can't do anything on their own bishop b3 hits the rook rook up to d3 and bishop a4 so wesley is trying to reposition that bishop maybe exchange off but more than that he wants to give that knight the d5 square but there are problems with this well there are problems with whatever he did bishop e5 so basically he's now threatened to take on f6 and play bishop f3 and that would win material um and there's another nice move here as well so if for example bishop c6 and that's the move one would like to make to cover the diagonal then rook g3 and this is all very sensitive looks great for white so once again we can see rooks and bishops combining beautifully they often do in the end game bishop b5 and now very nice little move from carlson little tactic he doesn't want to exchange those bishops that is certainly not what he wants bishop f3 instead hitting the rook so that if bishop takes bishop takes bishop and now again 
the rook is able to come down to the seventh, and this looks pretty unpleasant for black. Those wonderful bishops, the rook is active. You never know, he might be able to sneak around and, and take that pawn, or maybe maybe this one. So after bishop f3, Wesley played knight d5. Now, simple chess from Carlson. He exchanged on d5. Now, don't forget, this rook is attacked. What next? Rook g3, excellent move. Hitting the pawn on g6, so that advances. Rook c5, more pressure. The bishop came back to c6 to defend the pawn on d5. And rook f3, nice move. Attacking here, of course, if the king steps up, you've got rook f6 check. Um, if rook f8, rook f6. I like the way that the rooks connect. There's rook takes bishop, there's rook d6 check, must be winning. So rook f3, it's just been played. Attacking the pawn, f5. Ooh, that's the move we want to see. Now look at that wonderful bishop. Can't be driven away, sported by the pawn. Now things are opening up. You can see that seventh rank is now exposed. If that rook could just break through, that would be nasty. So what do you do? Well, you crack open a file, h5. So we're ready to, to move the rook in. Rook b5. Of course, Wesley wants to exchange pieces. But no. Rook c1. Great move. Um, here, well, if rook takes pawn, then the rook comes in on the king side. And in combination with that rook, which attacks the bishop, and of course the wonderful bishop on e5, I mean, that is actually a, a decisive attack on black's king. It's wonderful how white's rooks combine there. And yes, those rooks, dare I say it, split rooks. They cannot offer any defense at all in that situation. So rook c1 has just been played. Good move, keeping the rooks on the board. Rook e8, pawn takes pawn, pawn recaptures. Rook h3 wants to come down to h7. Or, well, any, any of these squares will do. Actually, yeah, of course, h7 is the threat. The rook can't interpose because of, uh, well, the bishop will be hanging at the end of it. Rook e6 protects the bishop. Check. The king moves to the back rank. Not pleasant, but there was no alternative. And now, how does Magnus continue? I really like this next move. This is beautiful stuff. B3, sweat baby, sweat. Black can do almost nothing in this position. It's a kind of Zugzwang, actually. The rook has to protect this. Um, the bishop doesn't really have any good squares. It's just an absolutely miserable position. In fact, I mean, this, this rook can't move back because of... Rook takes bishop, actually wins a piece. Just see that. So you can see in this position, basically black just doesn't have any decent moves at all. G5 played. And now, just to rub salt in the wound, bishop c7 check, and bishop b6. And now that rook has absolutely no decent move. It's completely trapped there. So in playing b3, of course, that stopped black's pawn advancing, which would have given the, ro the, the, the rook a little more room. Um, so basically, in effect, white is now playing the exchange up two rooks against rook and bishop. Completely hopeless. f4 played, now rook g7, and that pawn drops. Uh, what a, a wonderful positional squeeze from Magnus Carlsen. It just shows him at his in his in his element. Now it's a rapid play game, of course, you know, perhaps we wouldn't see such elegance in a in a classical game where your opponent has time to to kick up trouble, sack a pawn somehow, but still I think that is a really wonderful performance. 
The rest of the match, it has to be said, did not go so smoothly. And in fact, Wesley struck back in the very next game to level, then, well, two draws, and they went to a tie break. Carlson lost the first, he hit back, so it was one all after the Blitz games, and Carlson won a dramatic Armageddon game. Um, lots of thud, lots of blunder. Magnus made it through in the end through sheer determination. So it was a very entertaining match, but yeah, for me, that was just a superb lesson in positional chess. So there we go. Magnus Carlsen wins the FTX Crypto Cup. It sounds very sinister to me. Um, and wins a stack of stack of dollars and a Bitcoin. There we are. Um, let me see. There's more coming up on the channel very soon. Um, I hope you enjoyed my coverage of the tournament. Do consider supporting us on Patreon. There's lots of... Uh, yeah, extras, extra videos, newsletter, that kind of thing. Do check out the video on the homepage. Or if not, just throw us a cup of coffee via PayPal. Thanks for watching.